This morning as we uh, continue this throwback journey together, we're going way back, way before not only the church, but before Jesus was born. Obviously, he started way at the beginning, but we're talking about um, several hundred years before he was born on this earth. It was the time that Ezra and Nehemiah and Zerubbabel were rebuilding after the exile. And that whole story is a whole nother thing, and, and it's, it, there's so much depth in all of that. But we're going to go right to the middle of the story, chapter 9. And what happened was things were going pretty well. They were rebuilding the temple. They were rebuilding the wall. They were starting to reboot all of the traditions and rituals and sacrifices that God had told them to do, and they had completely abandoned. Things seemed to be going well. And then Ezra gets word that even a bunch of the people that were helping him do this, this, had already started intermarrying with all of the idolatrous nations around them. And as we've said many times over the years and always will to clarify this, God's problem is not with what we might call in American culture interracial marriage. His problem is with interreligion marriage. He, he forbid his people from marrying people who worshiped idols. He knew that this was just not going to be Okay, but this is happening. Even the people that are helping Ezra, Nehemiah, and Zerubbabel rebuild, they're doing this. And Ezra is just overwhelmed. He spends the whole day grieving. And then we jump in here on verse 5. He says, Then at the evening sacrifice, I rose from my self abasement with my tunic and cloak torn, and I fell on my knees with my hands spread out to the Lord my God and prayed. I am too ashamed and disgraced, my God, to lift up my face to you, because our sins are higher than our heads, and our guilt has reached to the heavens. Note the pronoun here. He doesn't say there. He says our. That's very important. Uh, and whenever we approach God, it's important that we approach him a lot more like Ezra did than how the Pharisees did. Jesus' parable about the Pharisees is one of his most well-known, and I'm sure you recognize it, but the Pharisee goes and says, God, I thank you that I am not like everybody else. I thank you that it's not me who's sinning. Ezra actually could have done that in this moment. It wasn't his problem. He was the one who's brokenhearted about it, but that's not how he approaches God. It's very significant. He continues, from the days of our ancestors until now, our guilt has been great. Because of our sins, we and our kings and our priests have been subjected to the sword and captivity, to pillage and humiliation at the hand of foreign kings as it is today. Now, if you keep going through this story, there's, as always, when there's people involved, there's good things and bad things. Their solution to this problem was something they came up with, and it didn't please God. And over in the prophet Malachi, the book of Malachi, he actually condemns their solution that they had at this moment. But what they got right was this idea of lament. That's one of the first things we need to talk about today, is to, to, if we're going to really thrive as God's people, we need to learn to recapture the idea of lament. Lament is where you actually pour out your true, deepest feelings to God. And sometimes those are happy. We would call that praise or worship or a bunch of those things. Sometimes it's not Lament is when you take your doubts to God, your fears to God, your frustrations to God. You admit to God that you feel broken and, and, and empty. You admit to God that you're angry, possibly even angry at him. It's a grand tradition all throughout the Bible. Several of the Psalms are Psalms of lament. We sang one last week. Psalm 130 begins, out of the depths I cry to you, my God. One of the most famous ones is Psalm 22. Jesus himself quoted it on the cross. It begins, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Another really famous one is 51, Psalm 51. David, when he finally got just how far he had fallen and just how terrible the layers and layers of sin that he had fallen into was, he calls out to God and he says, create in me a clean heart, O God. But when we approach God, 
with all the varnish gone, all the pretense gone, we just lay it out before him. It doesn't shock him. He already knows exactly what you feel, good and bad. He knows exactly what you did and why you did it and why you're frustrated with him or whoever else you're frustrated with. He just wants to connect with you at that moment. Doesn't make those feelings right, but if they're real, we start by connecting with God. This is the idea of lament. I'd like to acknowledge that I got the idea of using this story of Ezra for this message and several other ideas that you'll hear in the near future from a man named Jamar Tisby. And I highly recommend his series and his book, How to Fight Racism. He's got several other great ones. This particular one is on Right Now Media Right Now. And if you look at your sermon outline, that's always, you can find it digitally. If you're joining us digitally, it's in your bulletin insert as always here, but how to find that um, is, is right there. You can get a free uh, subscription to Right Now Media through Morrison Hill if you don't already have one. But I, I just want to acknowledge that. I also want to acknowledge that this next quote comes from Jessica Brody. It's on Christianity, Christianity.com. She says, at its core, lamentation is an act of faith, for God is the only one who can do something about our it's a lot like another thing that we don't really do in our culture much and we need to reclaim as God's people is the idea of shouting Hosanna to God. Maybe not literally, but as we go through every Palm Sunday and remember together, the word Hosanna, it means two things at the same time. Save us and you are the only one who can save us. And lament is much like that. God, I'm coming to you. Where else can I go? God, how long is it going to take you to answer my prayers? But I hope you do because nobody else is going to. It's just being real with God. James, one of the earliest uh, church leaders that we know about, he led the church in Jerusalem right after, right through the book of Acts. He writes this, submit yourself then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Come near to God and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Grieve, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up. Don't mean to start so dark, but this is real. This, are, are we okay? Are we good? Still breathing? So good? Okay, praise God. Here we go. Let's remind ourselves now, we're fast-forwarding through history one more time. We'll catch up where we left off last week. Jesus started the church, and he called it an ecclesia, which was a term that the people in his day absolutely knew meant two things. Everybody's invited, and whoever joins has a voice and a responsibility. That's what that word implied to them. And he said he would build this new thing built around him and who he is. Fast forward to where we left off last week. We had the um, Reformation where the church had kind of drifted for a really long time and uh, we needed to be born again as a body. Now, there were actually some good things that happened in the Dark Ages. Next week, we'll talk about that. It wasn't completely dark. God had not abandoned his people, and not all of God's people had abandoned him, but it was an age. We've got to own that. It was an age of a lot of darkness and corruption, and the world looks back on that era and sees that the church completely failed, and we as the church have got to own that. Are you with me? To talk to people outside of the world, we've got to be able to own that. But even as people started to reimagine things and to go back to the original and try to recapture what Jesus had first done, they still ended up with these models with a guy at the top. You had the Lutheran church with Martin Luther at the top. You had the English church, which became the Anglican church, and it had Henry VIII at the top. And he wasn't even a Christian. He was the king. He just wanted authority over part of the church. Didn't want to have to answer to anybody else. And you had John Calvin, and you had all these other people, and everybody started saying, well, I, I will worship with you if you agree with how Luther interprets the Bible. I'll worship with you if you agree with how Calvin interprets the Bible. They lost track of just the Bible and 
Jesus, even as things were being reborn. And here's the second thing we've got to own as Christians. We've got to just get it if we can move on, is complexity. Some things can be so simple, but you get people involved. (laughs) You know what I'm talking about. I can't tell you how many times my sons and I have helped move furniture for people. And we actually enjoy it most of the time, get along pretty well. We've learned how to do that. But as I was praying over this, I just kept getting these images of moving couches through doorways. It's a pretty simple concept. Pick up the object, move it through the doorway, right? How many have ever moved a couch, especially when those that parts of it fold out or, you know what I'm talking about? And the more people, the easier it is to pick it up, right? But the more people, the more complicated it gets. Just being real. It's not good or bad. It's true. It's just true. It gets complicated. Nothing that's really, truly good in this world. Hear me on this. Nothing that's truly, profoundly good is ever going to be 100% simple because it's going to include people. Everything that God loves includes people, and we make it complicated, y'all. We make it so complicated, and it's worth it to God. It needs to be worth it to us. Everything that's worth doing, everything that makes life worth living requires work and working together. I'm going to say that one more time. Everything that is worth doing, everything that makes life worth living requires work and working together. And it's simple. It's complicated because we're involved. Everybody get this? Here's a couple of scriptures to tell us how simple it can be, but it's not always. 1 John 1, 7 says, If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. The blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. That's simple, right? And if we're all following Jesus and we all have the light on, everything's great. But the second one of us closes our eyes, the second one of us turns away from Jesus, and we're still holding on to the same couch, there's problems, right? And this is how it works. Galatians 3, 26, there is neither Jew nor Gentile. Neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. So before God, we're all equal. We all have an equal footing at the foot of the cross. But how many know that everybody's perspective is a little different? How you look at things, how you've experienced life up to any given moment when you're having a conversation with somebody, you have a different perspective, right? So we're all one, we're all equal, that's simple. But where's the conversation going to go? It gets complicated. And so often, here's the tragedy, so often the stuff that is so simple in the scripture is not the stuff we fight over. It's not the stuff we split churches over. It's not the stuff that we make a dividing line. Here is, everybody on this side is for Jesus. For example, James again, James 1.27, religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and keep oneself from being polluted by the world. How many churches have you heard that have split over something about how they see spiritual gifts, for example, or some, something like that? Have you heard about that? Different denominations split over how you word the Trinity or the purpose of baptism. You ever heard stuff like that? Have you ever heard churches that the whole denomination is about, no, we, we take care of orphans and widows more than any other church ever? Where are they? Why aren't we that church? Do you understand what I'm saying? This is so simple, but we love to make it complex. We love to make it about a bunch of other things. Not that those things aren't important. They are. But some of the things that Jesus just straight up tells us, this is it. This is the most important. We can look over those and fight over the other ones. That's wrong. Got to keep going. 
Part of what made this whole thing happen, this reformation, was there was a rebirth going on in the entire world. It's called the Renaissance. There's, again, it's way more complex than we can go through in all of these. It comes from a French word, renaissance or something like that. I don't speak French, but it means rebirth. And so much was happening. So much new stuff was happening in the world. And there was just everything was changing, including stuff in the church. And there was good stuff and beautiful stuff and terrible stuff all at the same time. The way that we now look at science and music and art and so many other different things was actually shaped during this era in history. Also the way that we look at what church is and what church is all about. It was shaped during this. Uh, the idea of America and all the different ways to see America happened during that time. And there was some wonderful, good, beautiful stuff in there. And there was also a lot of really broken stuff. Because everybody from Europe, Christians or not, who came to America stole it from the indigenous people who were already here. And they brought slaves from Africa. And they thought that was okay with Jesus. Jamar Tisby reminds us that ad fontes is a Latin term that was kind of a rallying cry in his words during the Protestant Reformation. It means back to the sources. Part of the way that so many churches had gotten so far off track was because they only had the Latin translation and they didn't have any of the originals from Greek and Hebrew to study. And not only that, uh, what they really only had was the interpretations of the Latin scriptures that they heard at church. Nobody actually had the scriptures. Nobody actually could study the Bible for themselves. This is always, always, always why we give this to you, why we beg you to take this home. Read this stuff for yourselves. This is every scripture you'll see on here and a bunch that you don't. Every sermon is in here. My invitation is always take it back. If I'm wrong about something, come back and talk to me about it. This is not about me. This is not about our church. This is not about you just got to trust us. I'm not lying on purpose. But I'm telling you, you have the scripture in so many different translations, so many different language. Use it. Find out. Connect with God on your own. That's such a big thing. This is also an important concept when we're trying to talk about uh, the, the, the realities of American history and the church history. Talk to other people besides you and your family and your best friends. And just listen. When I say talk, what I really mean is listen for a little bit. Because their experience is going to be different than yours. And the solutions are not going to be as simple as we all wish they would be. The truth is not as simple as we all think it is. And if all you know is what you've heard on a blog on Facebook or at an at a email that came from someplace that you subscribe to get emails from, chances are it's been skewed a little bit. Am I right? Back to the sources. You want to know how other Americans feel about certain things? Talk to some other Americans. It doesn't mean they're right. It doesn't mean you're right. You want to know what they think? You got to ask them. In the Renaissance, there were so many great things that did happen. Uh, there was a lot of uh, advances in art. For example, even today, we know names like Donatello, Raphael, Michelangelo, and Leonardo. But if you ask anybody who's young, the guys on the bottom row are the ones they're going to think of first, right? Okay? Back to the sources. Back to the sources. We can use the same names and the same terms and, and, and the same, we think we're talking about the same stuff and we're not, right? If I'm talking about Donatello and I mean the guy up there on the top left and you think I'm talking about one of those turtles, our conversation isn't going to get anywhere good. It will be complex. I hope this all makes sense. 
But that's part of the problem when we talk about history and when we talk about everybody on every side of the issue wants to make it simple. Everybody wants to say, this is how it was. This is what it was about. This is why everybody did everything. This is what it was. Everybody always wants to do that. Everybody on all the sides. But the truth was it was all happening at the same time. People for the glory of God were exploring the planet and excited that they were reaching new places they didn't even know existed. They're finding people they didn't even know existed. And there were missionaries going from day one trying to help them and lead them to God. And at the same time, there's people going to those same places, even some of the same people, even people doing it in the name of God that are killing and stealing and raping and murdering. And they thought that's who Jesus was. And it's not okay. There is people. Sorry. There are people as they study science, they're starting to unlock some things and they're giving God the glory. Well, we had no idea just how beautiful and intricate everything actually is. And the more they discovered and the more they understood how it actually worked, they got more excited about God and gave him many more glory. And at the same time, they're coming up with theories that leave him out and theories that justify racism and justify things. Slavery became for the first time in history about a racist thing. It's during this era, 1400s, blurry, 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 all the way to 1800s. This is where this idea that we think about slavery came from. Before then, it was an economic reality, a really hard one, a sad one. But it was a lot more like what we would call employment than what we think of when we think of slavery now. It didn't have to do with what color your skin was. It was only about how much money you had. Are you with me? Doesn't make it right or wrong. It was just different. But in this era, Christians... Christians believed that this was how it was supposed to be. The pale of your skin was is somehow related to how powerful you should be in the world. And the darker your skin was, you, you kind of somehow deserved to serve everybody else. It's so broken. It's so wrong. It's so absolutely a lie of the devil. And somehow or another, Christians embedded this into the fabric of America. It's in the Constitution. It's in everything. Is there great stuff in there too? Absolutely. Do I love all the great stuff? Yes. Do I still love Jesus in the church? Absolutely. But we've got to realize that when people say this is in there, it was. And it still is. And we've got to get it out of there. It's not okay. Because here's the other thing that we have to embrace if the church is going to thrive. We need the whole body working together. We've got to embrace one another. And by one another, I mean the people in our family, our church family, who see things differently. The people in our church family who see this verse like this and see the same verse like this, but somehow or another, they all agree on Jesus and they can take care of widows and orphans side by side. Is this making sense? And, and, and we've got, it's got to extend there. It's got to be people that look different, people from different economic statuses. It's got to be people that sound different. They're people that don't live anywhere around here. It's got to be everybody. It's got to be all the different denominations. It's got to be somehow anybody who's genuinely trying to seek God. We've got to be able to seek him and serve him together. If we have a chance at all of getting it right, of being the generation that finally actually gets it right, we've got to get all of this right. We've got to be able to lament what's not there. We've got to be able to embrace the complexity and stop fighting over trying to just, let's get it into five words or less, y'all. If you don't agree with those five words, you're out. You're not even going to heaven. Let's stop that. It's okay. It's complex. There's a lot of us. We need everybody. We need to embrace one another so that together we can embrace the world. Let's go back to scripture for a few moments. Paul writes to the Colossians, my goal is that they may be encouraged in heart and united in love so that they may have the full riches and complete understanding in order that they may know the mystery of God, namely Christ, 
In other words, we don't know that fully unless we embrace one another. Do you see that? In whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I tell you this so that no one may deceive you by fine-sounding arguments. Don't we love our fine-sounding arguments? Don't we love to be right? Prove somebody else wrong? That's not what it's about. Colossians 2 continued. See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the elemental spiritual forces of this world rather than on Christ. They have lost connection with the head from whom the whole body, supported and held together by its ligaments and sinews, grows and causes it to grow. When I was a kid, uh, mom and dad did some of their training to be missionaries in Mexico. And one of the things they had to learn how to do was kill chickens. I know this seems disjointed, but stick with me. It's short and it's not a derail. It's important. Turns out it's true. When you cut off a chicken's head, the rest of the body can still survive for a little bit. As a little kid, it was my job to chase down the bodies. <laughs> and th man, those things were fast. <laughs> they could cover some ground. They could still make noise. They could still do quite a bit without their heads. Of course, they were doomed. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> Even without my help, they were eventually going to fall down. My job was basically follow them till they did fall down and carry them back to where they needed to be. I still remember that, though, and just being crazy. How long they could survive without being connected to their head? Well, a church can do the same thing. We can, we can keep a lot of stuff going that Jesus doesn't really care about at all, and it looks and feels about the same. And we don't even know that we're disconnected for a little bit. That's why it's so important that we have to relentlessly as individuals in small groups and as a big group and as part of the entire big group of Christians around the world, we have to relentlessly keep trying to humble ourselves before the Lord, to draw near to him so that he will draw near to us, to resist the devil so he will flee from us. We've got to relentlessly keep approaching him in this way. Back to James again. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save them? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? That's a rhetorical question. It means it's no good at all. In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. Someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith by my deeds. You believe that there is one God? Good. Even the demons believe that and shudder. Who wants to be in a church that's theologically in total agreement with demons? I'm not actually raising my hand. Well, I am, but not. I don't. Do you? All you have to do is believe there's one God and you've you're got the same theology as a demon. All religions are not the same. All ideas are not the same. Demons believe in God, but they're not going to heaven. Hell was created for them, right? So we've got to lament. And, and the world needs to know this. Your friends need to know this. Your family needs to know this. Everybody needs to know that we get it, that we have messed up collectively. And we, like Ezra, we need to learn to stop Say, well, it, it, I, it wasn't me. I mean, it obviously wasn't me myself. Of course it wasn't. You weren't even born. But it was part of us. Are you with me? And we can say, yes, we split the body of Christ into a thousand little pieces. I don't know if we'll ever get them all back together again. Yes, we actually stole an entire country from the indigenous people who lived there. Yes, we enslaved Africans for years and years and years, and we preached that it was okay in church. And it's not okay. We've got to be able to say it's not. And we need to be leading the charge about fixing whatever still needs fixed in this country. Because the church helps set up all the stuff that's broken. 
They also set up all the good stuff. Next week, we'll talk about that. But we've got to be able to admit we did the bad stuff too. Complexity. We've got to be able to embrace the complexity. That means embrace each other. We've got to be able to embrace one another. If we're going to fulfill the great commission together, we've got to be able to do it together. We can't do it alone. Connected to each other and connected to the head, we can actually get somewhere. 1 John 3. And this is his command. Here's another one of those really simple ones that we can complicate out the wazoo, but this is pretty simple. This is his command, to believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ. And once again, name in the scripture, where it says the name of God, the na- praise the name of Jesus. It's not just that they like the name Jesus so much. It's praising who he is, his identity, his authority, his power. Who he is. He is the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And everything else we believe is based around that. So he says, believe in the name of Jesus Christ and to love one another as he commanded us. As he commanded us. The one who keeps God's commands lives in him and he in them. And this is how we know that he lives in us. We know it by the spirit he gave us. John also writes, no one who lives in him keeps on sinning. No one who continues to sin has either seen him or known him. Peter, who also spent a lot of time with Jesus, writes this. Finally, all of you, be like-minded. Peter, of all people, should know that doesn't mean everybody needs to think the same way. It means we agree on what's the most important. Namely, Jesus. Finally, all of you be like-minded, be sympathetic. In other words, be compassionate to people, see things differently. Love one another, be compassionate and humble. All of this stuff has to happen at once, just like all the goodness and the messiness happens at once in the world. Just like all the beauty and the ugliness happens all at once in the world. When we do all of this at the same time, we actually fulfill Jesus' dreams for the church. Here's what it looks like when we all use our gifts for him. If anyone speaks, Peter says, they should do so as one who speaks the very words of God. If anyone serves, they should do it with the strength God provides so that in all things, God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To him be the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. As we wrap up this morning, I want to go back to where we started the story of Ezra. I'm not going to tell you the end of the story. You should go back and read it. If you notice in this week's Bible study that I already keep pointing out to you, a lot of these, it just says chapter two or something like that. You should read the whole thing in context. I hope you do that. But the reason they solved their problem, quote unquote, in a way that actually broke God's heart is because they didn't consult him about it. The big problems that we are talking about today are not going to be solved because we have a little committee meeting right after church today or something like that. It's going to be all of us embracing the three things that we've talked about and deciding individually and together that we're going to be the generation that gets this right. And we're going to embrace that it's going to be complicated. And we're going to embrace that it's going to probably be messy. And we're never going to all 100% agree on how to go about it or what to do next. But if we understand that Jesus wants us to fix these things, and we commit to do that together under his lordship, we could be the generation that finally gets it done. We could actually reach every nation. Jesus could actually come back in our lifetime. I'm not the only one that wants that, right? Let's get it done. Whatever first step you need to make this morning, make it as we stand and sing.